There are very few structural elements in wood construction that appear more ordinary and simple yet play a critical role in wood construction than top plates. The top plate is the horizontal member that crowns the wall. The physical location of the top plate makes it a boundary and bridge. It marks the upper terminus of the wall but also forms the foundation of the framing above. Structurally, the top plate is part of the wall system. However, when considering its functional commitment, the top plate serves both the wall and the roof or upper floor in equal measure. If you eliminate the top plates from a wall, the wall becomes a collection of individual studs without physical continuity and collective strength. The top plate transforms the wall into a harmonious system that communicates forces and coordinates a unified response. This simple exchange between load and resistance is the hallmark of the quiet harmony that the top plate brings to wood framing. In this video, we will compare the code requirements of double top plates with the strict and cautious guidelines that are necessary for single top plates at bearing walls. We will begin by looking at the role of top plates in wood framing which will open the way to appreciate the differences in the International Residential Code's framing requirements for single and double top plates. Top plates perform three primary functions in wood frame structures. First, they distribute concentrated loads from the roof or floor framing across multiple studs. When a joist or truss does not align directly above a stud, the top plates act as a beam, spreading the load to adjacent studs and maintaining a continuous load path. The rafter or truss imparts a concentrated force onto the top plates, inducing bending moments and shear forces along the length spanning between the studs. These internal forces are resisted by the bending and shear strength of the top plates. The magnitude of these forces depends on factors such as stud spacing, the location of the applied load, and the intensity of that load. A wider stud spacing or a higher load intensity from the trusses results in relatively higher moment and shear demands on the top plates. These demands makes the top plates critical elements in load path analysis. The International Residential Code acknowledges this structural function through strict requirements for the spacing of studs and the location of rafters landing on the top plates with respect to the location of the studs. We will look at these requirements shortly. The second primary function of top plates is their role in transferring out of plane loads from the wall to the roof framing system. While it's common to think of walls as supporting the roof, the reverse is also true. The roof also supports the wall. When seismic loads or wind pressure acts laterally on an exterior wall, the wall studs resist this out-of-plane load and deliver their reactions to both the sill plate and the top plates. According to item 17 of the fastening schedule in section R602.3 of the International Residential Code, the attachment between the studs and top plates requires either toenails or end nails. For top plate to stud connections using common nails, the code requires either 4 8 penny common nails for a toenail connection or 2 16 penny common nails for an end nail connection. These nails transfer the lateral reactions at the ends of the studs due to out of plane wind loads or seismic loads from the studs to the top plates. The top plates, acting as horizontal beams, transfers these loads to the rafters or trusses fastened above. These loads eventually end up on the roof diaphragm from where they will be picked up by the top plates on the walls parallel to the direction of the load. This brings us to the third role of top plates where they act as collectors. Beyond their role in supporting gravity loads, top plates also function as collectors that pick up lateral forces such as wind and seismic forces from the roof and transfer these forces to the shear walls or braced walls. When wind or seismic forces act on a building, the roof and floor diaphragms become the centroids where these forces concentrate due to the mass of these diaphragms as well as a load path system that delivers the forces from other systems as we saw when considering out-of-plane loads on walls. The diaphragms act as horizontal beams spanning between the walls that are parallel to the direction of the force. From these diaphragms, the loads are transferred into the top plates of the walls that run parallel to the direction of the applied force. 
Top plates on an interior wall that does not have shear wall segments or braced wall segments will not perform this function because they do not have the load path or adequate stiffness to attract these loads. This role is therefore limited to wall lines with lateral or shear bracing and sufficient load path connections to deliver the forces to the top plates. Let us consider a simple rectangular building bounded by wall lines 1, 2, A and C and also includes an interior wall line B. Braced walls are provided along line 1, 2, A and C while no bracing is provided along line B. If wind or seismic forces act from east to west, the resulting shear in the roof diaphragm will be delivered to the top plates of walls A and C but not to the top plates at line B. This is because line B does not have a deliberate well-detailed load path to deliver the forces and does not have sufficient stiffness as is the case at line A and C. Any load that makes it to line B is incidental which means that it is neither accounted for or relied upon during the design of the system. Therefore, the top plates at wall line A and C will pick up the forces from the roof diaphragm and distribute them to the shear wall segments provided along both lines. When it comes to fulfilling their role as collectors, the most critical property of top plates is continuity. A discontinuity or weak splice in the top plate can interrupt the flow of lateral forces, diminishing the building's overall performance. We shall see that the International Residential Code recognizes this structural reality, requiring that top plates be lapped or mechanically tied to maintain continuous force transfer. This provision ensures that when the roof or floor diaphragm pushes, the top plate can effectively deliver that force to the resisting elements quietly preserving the building's stability under lateral load. The International Residential Code provides prescriptive guidance that defines how top plates must be constructed to ensure continuity, strength and reliable load transfer. Section R 602.3.2 .2 states that wood stud walls shall be capped with a double top plate installed to provide overlapping at corners and intersections with bearing partitions. This section immediately sets the double top plate as the default framing practice and establishes its necessity on the basis of overlapping at corners and intersections. The unmistakable intent here is to ensure that separate wall segments behave as a single, integrated system. The code specifies that end joints shall not be offset less than 24 inches. This requirement deals with the need for continuity in top plates while at the same time taking advantage of the redundancy introduced by using double top plates instead of a single plate. According to the code, if an end joint occurs in the plate above, the plate below should not have an end joint within 24 inches of the end joint of the plate above. First, let us look at this provision from the perspective of the role of the top plates supporting gravity loads from the framing above. This provision prevents the introduction of a line of weakness in the top plates within the same span which undermines the ability of the top plate to support bearing loads from framing above. The 24-inch limit effectively means that both plates cannot have an end joint within one stud bay. The introduction of an end joint within one plate effectively means that bearing loads from a truss or rafter will be supported by the continuous plate unless joints are only permitted to occur over studs. However, the code states that joints in the plates do not need to occur over studs. This means that the code does not see any problem with a joint on one plate at the mid-span with a truss or rafter landing at the same point. We can infer that the code fundamentally assumes that one plate in a double plate system has sufficient capacity to support bearing loads in wall systems. By requiring that plates be not less than 2 inches in nominal thickness and at least as wide as the studs, the code establishes a minimum dimensional standard that ensures each plate possesses an adequate baseline strength to support bearing loads. At this point, one might naturally wonder whether the code imposes any limits on the spacing of studs. The further apart the studs are spaced, the higher the bending moments and shear forces imposed on the plate supporting the load. This concern is made even more significant when a joint occurs in one of the plates, leaving the other to carry the entire demand. 
Section R 602.3.3 of the International Residential Code speaks directly to this issue. It specifically addresses conditions where roof rafters or trusses are spaced more than 16 inches on center while the bearing wall studs below are spaced at 24 inches on center. In most conventionally framed roof systems using rafters or even engineered roof systems using manufactured trusses, rafters or trusses are typically spaced at 24 inches on center supported by bearing wall studs spaced at 16 inches. However, when both the roof framing members and the wall studs are spaced at 24 inches on center, the code requires that each rafter or truss bear within 5 inches of the stud below unless one of three specific exceptions is satisfied. The first exception requires using larger plates such as two 2x6 two or two 3x4 members. This means that a bearing wall with 2x6 studs spaced at 24 inches on center with double 2x6 top plates is exempted from the alignment requirement. Similarly, a bearing wall with 2x4 studs spaced at 24 inches on center with double 3x4 plates is also exempted from the alignment requirement. The second exception requires adding a third top plate. This means that instead of two 2x4 two plates, the wall in question will have three 2x4 two plates. The additional plate is meant to increase the bending and shear strength of the top plates to allow greater flexibility in the placement of the rafters and trusses. Finally, the third exception requires the installation of solid blocking that is equal in size to the studs directly beneath the plate. The blocking reinforces the top plates and transfers bearing loads to the supporting studs. Let us now turn our attention to the effect of top plate end joints on collector continuity so that we can appreciate the requirements in section R 602.3.2. The end joint on a top plate introduces a break in collector continuity. If end joints occur on both plates at the same location, one part of the wall system may pull away from the other part due to lack of continuity under tensile forces within the plates as a result of seismic and wind effects. To prevent this from happening, the code requires the top plates to be fastened at end joints to facilitate the transfer of forces from the plate with the break to the continuous plate. The fastening requirements for double top plate splices at end joints are provided in item 14 of the fastening schedule in section R602.3. The code requires 8 16 penny common nails on each side of the end joint as shown and firmly reiterates the minimum 24 inch spacing between end joints at both plates. Other fastening options with box nails are also provided. If we look closely at what is happening at this joint, we can see that the axial tensile force in the plates is effectively transmitted through only one plate at the joint. If you ignore plates with notches or holes for pipes, this is the weakest part of the system and yet quite sufficient when it comes to typical loads expected in conventionally framed structures. This connection ensures that continuity is maintained while at the same time revealing the inherent redundancy introduced by double top plates at locations without joints. Quick pause before moving on. If you are a builder, designer, DIY enthusiast, or even planning your own home, and you're serious about understanding conventional wood framing, then I invite you to explore the residential wood framing design series at www.conventionalframing.com. This course methodically unpacks the International Residential Code's wood framing provisions into streamlined, practical lessons covering roofs, walls, floors, foundations, and wall bracing in wood-framed residential buildings. The crown jewel of this course is a complete structural design of a single-family home that culminates in the development of final construction drawings required for permit issuance. The training series is comprehensive, affordable, and available on demand. Please visit www.conventionalframing.com to learn more. Let us now get back to single-member top plates. We have already mentioned that double top plates are the default framing standard for bearing walls. 
The provisions for single top plates are not given in a separate code section but rather appear as an exception within section R602.3.2 which is the section that establishes the primacy of double top plates in conventional framing. The exception allows a single top plate as an alternative to double top plates provided its framing complies with three requirements. The first requirement specifies that the plates shall be tied at corners, intersecting wall joints and butt joints at straight walls in accordance with Table R602.3.2. The table provides requirements for splice plates and their fastening requirements at corners and intersecting walls as well as butt joints in straight walls. The splice plates are the only way to provide continuity required to transmit axial tensile forces and join intersecting wall sections to prevent lateral separation. The second requirement when using single top plates specifies that rafters or joists shall be centered over studs with a tolerance of not more than one inch. The code does not permit single plates to support roof and upper floor loads in bending by spanning between the studs. The possibility of a joint within that span completely eliminates the adequacy of the plate to support any vertical load that is bearing within the span between the studs. A single top plate does not have the redundancy that allows the double top plate to serve this purpose as we observed. For a single top plate framework, the single top plate should not be relied upon to support gravity loads from the roof through bending between the studs. Rafters or joists landing on the plate must be centered over studs with a tolerance of not more than one inch. Finally, the code allows single top plates to be omitted over headers where the headers are tied to the adjacent wall sections in accordance with Table R602.3.2. This requirement ensures collector continuity from the top plates to the header by requiring splice plates between the top plate and header. In conclusion, the use of a single top plate represents a calculated deviation from the redundancy and strength that define conventional double top plate framing. It is a design choice that trades simplicity for precision, permitted only when alignment, continuity, and connection are carefully controlled. The code's requirements in section R602.3.2 are not arbitrary constraints. This is a reflection of the structural logic that undergirds the need for load paths that remain unbroken and joints that act in unison as well as for framing that preserves integrity even at its boundaries. When executed correctly, a single top plate system demonstrates that efficiency in framing must never come at the expense of structural continuity. Thanks for watching and if you'd like more training on conventional construction, please check out www.conventionalframing.com. If you found this video helpful, be sure to like, subscribe, and stay tuned for more insights into wood framing.